thank you very much. I'm absolutely delighted to be back here in Dublin. I came from my hotel where I stayed this night, um, walking from Brooks over here, and I was thinking, uh, the first time I was a young student in 71 or 72, I came the first time to Dublin. And um, walking down here through Dublin, I thought, Europe has been good to Ireland. <laughs> this, this was, a, was it like really? It's nice to see that, you know. Despite all the problems we have, you had, and everyone else, right? And so, um, it's in this spirit maybe that I would like to give you my presentation, um, which is um, on on a very special issue, but we could broaden it up and. Uh, in a, in a broader context, maybe some of you have seen that last week um, I had organized an appeal signed by many intellectuals in, in Europe, was published in English by The Guardian last uh, Friday, um, where we call for the election of uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, not necessarily because uh, we side with his party political views or with the personality, but in order to rebalance the institutions in the European Union. And maybe we can have a quick discussion of that <coughs> at the end, I don't know. But it is slightly related to what I'm going to do. However, I'm going to talk about um, a very specific technical issue, which nevertheless I believe is absolutely crucial, which is uh, the issue of, of internal imbalances and flow of funds, which is a technical issue in the, related to that. Um, there are two explanations for the crisis, basically, we can say. There is the, the fundamentalist thesis, which is either there was excessive deficit, sort of the German view, <coughs> and, 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 and break of fiscal discipline, or, and this is more the Commission's view, um, uh, imbalances. Um, regional imbalances, and to an essential degree, these imbalances are uh, measured by current account deficits. And I think this is wrong, and I think this leads to policy recommendations which have made the crisis worse. And therefore, I, th I would like to question that whole theoretical approach. There's, of course, also another dimension which I will not discuss here today, which is that maybe the crisis has, to a large degree, also been a financial crisis, banking crisis, and related to that were um, issues of liquidity and risk premia and mismanagement of the risk perception during the crisis and so on, but, which is, I think, an important part of the whole drama, but this is not my subject today. So, the question of macroeconomic imbalances, what um, action does it mean? Well, you see here um, a chart on the current account, uh, uh, the GDP uh, ratios. Um, you see that for the euro area as a whole, it was very much close to zero. But if you split it between the north and the south, and I consider uh, Ireland to be uh, south, because I don't like when people talk about pigs and things like that. Um, you see that the north has been having current account surpluses until the crisis, which is this line here, and the uh, south has had huge deficits. So looking at that, a lot of people, including European Commission, said, ah, that's a problem. And we need, therefore, to do something to reduce these imbalances. If you look at the countries, we see Germany huge from a deficit into a huge surplus. Um, you see also, um, with Ireland here, a continuous deterioration of the current account positions. <coughs> Same for Italy, Portugal, uh, Greece, and so on. So, um, Spain, you see that there are it looks like that's really the problem there. However, we have to be a little bit more subtle about this. The current accounts, we don't have... Uh, uh, a separation of 
um, current account payments within the euro area and the rest of the world, partly because there are these payments that go uh, in addition to trade. But the trade balance is a good proxy for what is the relative weight. And here what you see is trade balances um, within the euro area, the red line, um, the, the, the European Union 27 as a whole, and the, the green one is rest of the world, outside the euro area, or outside the European Union. And what you see for the euro area as a whole, um, the external one, trade balance, has improved. But if you look at Germany, what is interesting, this is zero and this is six percent of GDP up here. You see that huge surpluses in the European trade, um, a little less in the euro area because they all do a lot of business with, with the UK. And the green one is rest of the world. You see also that the green part was more or less the same as the euro area. But then, after the current or during and after the crisis, German current account surpluses or trade balance surpluses have been reduced to zero, but they have accumulated huge uh, surpluses for the rest of the world, particularly with China. Look at France. The rest of the world is balanced, but the big deficit is in European trade. Um, <clears throat> Ireland is here, which is um, starting at 4 and going up to 20% here. I mean, enormous surpluses, but this is straight. If you look at the current accounts, this we saw just before, there was a tendency to move into, de into deficit. Why? Because a lot of the profits that are generated by exporting from Ireland are done by international companies that repatriate their profits back to the US or wherever else it goes. So um, that's why this <coughs> the trade balance is not, in Ireland is not reflecting the current accounts. In Germany they are nearly identical. But what we see here is that, okay, European uh, current account, okay, there was a tendency also to deteriorate a little bit after the crisis up and now it's coming down. In intra-euro area trade and international trade pretty much the same way between uh, for the two uh, in, in, in Ireland. In, <clears throat> in Greece, everything is in deficit. And um, you may say, oh, that is, isn't that terrible? How can they survive? How can they pay for all the stuff they're importing? And I will come back to that issue because I think it's at the core of it. But what I want to say is the performances of individual member states are all very different. Netherlands has surpluses in European trade and deficits in international trade. So that picture um, needs to be integrated and we need to understand properly what it means um, in terms of the functioning of European monetary union. Now, during the first decade of uh, monetary union, European authorities, ECB, also the Commission, treated, have treated current account imbalances with benign neglect. Nobody thought that would really matter. And in fact, not even the Maastricht Treaty gave any consideration to current account deficits. And Ingram, already in 1973, really um, formulated the reason. He said, inter-community payments become analogous to inter-regional payments within a single country. So in other words, payments between Greece and Ireland are essentially of the same nature as payments from Dublin to Limerick. Blanchard and Jawazzi in 2002 also looked at the rising current account deficits uh, in Greece and Portugal, and they said they're exactly what theory suggests can and should happen when countries become more closely linked in goods and financial markets. And I still think they are right. Nevertheless, there is this revisionist approach which has been developed particularly by 
the Barroso Commission over the last few years, including the fact that then they created the so-called uh, avoidance of excessive deficit, uh, avoidance of excessive macroeconomic imbalances. And um, so we need to understand why did they revise it, what does it mean, what, what is the rationale of it. Now, the, the, I'm, the commission pretends they are looking at more than just current account uh, imbalances and in some ways this, is, this would be a good thing. The imbalance procedure could actually be a useful tool if it would be used correctly. But if you focus on current account deficits, I argue you are misusing this tool and I will explain you why. Now, the current account balances are a balance of payment item. What is the balance of pa payment? The balance of payment reports cross-border payments between currency areas because it is about how much foreign exchange you have in order to make your international payments. The idea being traditionally for the last 300 years or so that if you don't have enough foreign exchange reserves you can't pay outside the rest of the world and therefore you have a, 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 an accounting system to look at what that means. <coughs> In the old days, they, they shift gold and silver back and forth, and then they realize they don't need to do that. So we have nowadays the current accounts financed by the capital balance, meaning capital flows. And if there is an excess of that, it is a change of foreign exchange reserves. So in other words, um, you may have a current account or trade deficit that gets financed because someone lends you the money to buy these things, but also you have autonomous capital movements like um, buying property in Ireland or shares or bonds or things like that. And those together are affecting the foreign exchange <laughs> reserves, which are held by the central bank. So they are, in other words, a part of the balance sheet of the central bank and therefore of uh, the factors that determine money supply. So the important thing to understand, this is why I say taking the euro seriously, is that monetary union is not, not, not a fixed exchange rate arrangement. And this is one of the, the things that you here mistaken, have heard mistakenly during the crisis, and especially in Germany, like, oh, well, Greece could just leave. Oh, they can come back once they have done this. No, that might have been appropriate under the old European monetary system, but monetary union works absolutely and totally differently. In fact, the, the reason why it's different is because you have a union of payments and the money in the payment union comes from the central bank. And these monetary flows in euros between Ireland and Germany and Greece, they are not related to foreign exchange reserves. There are no foreign exchange reserves for Ireland in the terms of euros. What you have is euro balances in Irish banks. So the imbalances within the single market and the monetary union reflect imbalances in effective demand, but they are not affecting foreign exchange reserves. You have had some observers, I know two of them in Germany, who kind of talk about Irish euros, German euros. This is utter and total nonsense. Now, if you understand that, then um, it, it's, it's useful to simply look at some uh, national accounts. A simple thing that we economics professors teach first year in economics is that national income is consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. And uh, on the other hand, the income is um, government taxes and um, savings, and so you can combine these two and you will get 
an equation which is here which shows that the calendar account balance is a function of the government deficit, the difference between tax income and government spending, and the savings investment balance. Now, what does that mean? It means that if you have a current account deficit, you must have either a high deficit uh, from the government, or you must have an excessive amount of investment so that foreign savings are financing your domestic investment. That's just a simple identity. There's nothing, not, not big theory in any of this. But what it implies, of course, also is that if you have a deficit here and you want to reduce it, like the European Commission says, reduce imbalances, what are you going to do? Well, you will either reduce investment and public spending by the governments, or you increase savings and taxes, which is basically saying you will have to implement severe austerity. And that means that you are slowing down economic demand and probably economic growth. And as we have seen during the crisis, wherever those policies have been imposed, they have dramatically reduced growth rates. And that is a serious issue for other reasons which I come back to in a moment. So, I think that kind of policy, although it might be appropriate in modest proportions, when you use it in a severe crisis like we have had, it has made the crisis worse. Now, then it means in monetary union, looking at current account and current account deficits makes no sense. To which some people say, oh, but this is just, you're crazy. If you have a deficit, you have to pay for it. The commission even says it increases foreign debt. I mean, come on, foreign debt. What is foreign debt of Ireland when it's denominated in euro and has been financed by a German bank? It's not foreign, it's European debt. So what exactly is happening when Euro member states, I mean states, I mean by that the statistical system of the state because it's private as well as public debt, <coughs> if they are reporting intra-trade imbalances? Well, it's very simple. Monetary union is a payment union. So it means that there has been more payments going out than payments going in. Which means what? It means that the money balances have been shifted from, let's say, uh, Greece to Germany. It's just a, a, a redistribution of euro money balances that exist. The ECB looks at the aggregate. They don't care whether you keep the money in Ireland or in Germany or in Italy. And when you have these in trade imbalances in order to pay for the imports, you are sending the money there. Where does the money come from? That we will need to see. But it means on aggregate, for the euro area as a whole, these imbalances do not affect the money supply which is the purpose of monetary policy. But what it might cause and create is what Olivier Blanchard has called rotating slumps, and I would add there is a counterpart to it, which are rotating booms. Now, this to me sounds a rather, um, um, uh, how should I say, close to reality. You remember in the early 2000s we had um, booms in Ireland, in Spain, and we had a slump in Germany. Everyone said, oh, Germany is terrible, you know, it's like slow growth, they are so sclerotic, they need structural reforms. Then Schröder did all kinds of things which ruined his party and the German welfare system, but um, suddenly then Things turned around, now it is says, Germany, wonderful, these reforms, they have done all the difference. As the IMF, they have calculated what the effect of these labor market reforms have been. The result is econometrically a homeopathic impact. <laughs> <laughs> 
But what has clearly happened is there has been a huge shift from the south, where the boom was before, into Germany, where it is now. As a little footnote, if you ask me what's going to happen next, I would say, given this logic, what you probably will hear is that in about three, four years' time, when the minimum wage has been implemented, few other retirement has been increased with the present social democratically influenced the government, people will say, oh, Germany, they have ruined everything they have had. It's a very bad country now. It's too expensive. And then the capital will go somewhere else. The question is, where will it go? Now, it might be um, the South. That wasn't such a good idea. Germany is off. So then maybe... I, at the moment, I hesitate. Either it will be Italy because Renzi is doing the right thing, but I don't believe in Italy. So uh, I think more likely it will go to France, and then everyone will say, oh, France is a fantastic country. <laughs> <laughs> the only question I have is, will it happen before the election, re-election of uh, Hollande, or after the election of Marine Le Pen. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, I'm not going to bore you with the details of this, but this is to show that I'm academically sound. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can read this in my book on competitiveness in the European Union. What, what does this show? It shows what's happening with inter-euro area payments. We have the balance sheet of the Bundesbank, Banca d'Italia, and the Euro system, stylized thing a little bit, and you see, okay, there's, they, they aggregate up, and you have the total balance sheet, some meaning some money supply of 1,500, and then you shift it around, you make a payment from Italy to Germany, so it increases a little bit the balances in Germany, it reduces them in Italy, but overall it remains the same, which is what I said before. Now, that's the first thing. Now, what if Germany exports to the US or to China? Well, then it changes foreign exchange balances. Where? Not, well, not really in Germany, for the euro system as a whole. So therefore, we get a surplus in the euro area, and that affects the balance sheet of the ECB, and therefore money supply. So in that case, um, we see here money supply has increased from 1,900 to 2,050 given that there's been a sale from 150 here. But you could also say how is the intercurrent account deficit financed within the euro area so that the Irish current account deficit, the Greek deficits and so on who has financed that? And the answer is extremely simple. It's paid by borrowing money from banks. And then um, you are taking that money, you go to uh, Anglo-Irish Bank, you get a loan, and you buy a property in, I don't know, Spain, why not? And, um, and that's it. Where did the banks get the money from? from the ECB, central bank. That's the system. And um, so, in other words, um, you could also go, your Irish company, you go and borrow from Deutsche Bank, huge lender to Ireland, as a matter of fact. And that's it. Now, the effect of that, of course, is an increase in money supply in total. Here, here is the the, the statistical effects. The, the central bank could intervene on, in that by sterilizing it, you know, shifting it from here to there by raising interest rates if they think this is too big and so on. But the bottom line is that's the business of monetary policy. <coughs> the question you may want to ask is, well, how, if they have borrowed the money from the bank, how is it paid back? And in particular, if it is borrowed from Germany, don't we need to have a current account surplus to pay it back in Germany? Well, 
in the good old days of the gold standard or whatever, that would have been right, even under the European monetary system, that would have been right. We would have needed to earn foreign currency so that we can pay back the, 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 the money we have borrowed in foreign currency. But now we just get the money from the ECB, so we don't need that anymore. But what we do need is, we need to pay back the money we have borrowed. So, in other words, um, the source of funds to pay back our debt and the interests are a surplus in income, which means we need economic growth. And this growth will have, can come both from the tradable and the non-tradable sector. So, in other words, um, if you are generating sufficient domestic growth, you have the income to pay back your bank. And it doesn't matter whether it's exporting things to Germany or to America or not. Now, that is important because the Commission recommendation in the avoidance of macroeconomic imbalances, focusing on the current accounts, they said, you need to reduce by, with austerity the demand, etc., etc. Here we say the opposite. You need to maintain the economic growth in both the export sector and in the domestic uh, non-tradable sector. So, that's why I said before, I think the Commission's recommendation are really making a serious mistake because they are um, imposing policies that have slowed down growth and now servicing the interest and the debt becomes more difficult than before. So you need growth and you need profitability and that's an issue of competitiveness which I will uh, come back in a moment. But what does all that mean for economic imbalances? Does it mean imbalances are totally um, irrelevant? Not entirely, but it means that the current account category is the wrong one to look at this. What is more important is flow of funds. Now, flow of funds are the macroeconomic equivalent of a cash flow statement for a country. And what... Um, they are showing our functional categories within the economy between essentially uh, households, which under textbook assumptions should save, corporations, which borrow in order to invest, and in the textbook thing, government and the rest of the world should be imbalanced. In the Keynesian assumption, we have households that save, and then Keynesian argument was that if the co corporations do not borrow, someone else needs to borrow to maintain the demand, and that would be the government, to absorb the excessive savings in that case. So that means the flow of funds is the correct instrument to uh, assess imbalances, and what we find when we look at that is that Europe's weakness is the corporate sector borrowing. Now, here you see it for the euro area as a whole. The blue line on the top, this is lending, this is borrowing. Um, the households are lending, saving and lending. That's how it should be. We see that there are variations, and after the crisis in the uncertainty, households started to save much more. We see the, 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 um, the, the green line is the rest of the world, which is the current account position of the euro area as a whole. But what is relevant for our discussion now is the black one is the corporate sector. And what, what do we find, especially during the crisis, first 2009-10, and now again, the corporate sector is actually lending, or to put it differently, they are saving instead of borrowing. Why are they doing it? They are paying back previous uh, debt. It's deleveraging. And this aggregate effect of deleveraging is the same as household savings in macroeconomic terms. 
Now, immediately in the, gov in, the, in the crisis, the first response of governments was what Keynesian theory would say, you have to borrow. So they did that. But then, as soon as the economy started to stabilize, like in the US, the Europeans said, ha, oh, stability and growth pack, you have to now consolidate. This can't go on forever. So they quickly started to, de to, to reduce the borrowing again. The stimulating effect was becoming weaker and weaker. Remember, the governments have, uh, the corporate sector is deleveraging, but they are starting to do the same thing in a way. And the households, okay, reduce a little bit their lending, but not much. Why are they doing it? Probably also because now there's no demand anymore. So there's slowdown, economic growth, and there's less saving, less income, and therefore also less savings and all that. So what we find here is that the, the, the corporate sector in the deleveraging, and we can show this similar dynamics have happened in Japan over the last 20 years and so on, with a, an early exit from stimulus policies in the euro area have made the recession worse. Compare that with the US, I don't have the data here now, but when you look at the data for the US, you see that the Obama administration has been much more gradual in their fiscal consolidation, which of course is criticized by the Republicans, but overall has maintained the economic growth um, in the US at a much better rate. A further advantage of flow of fund analysis is that it, it also can be used for regional analysis. And here we see that the corporate sector in the north has been lending to the south. This is the north, this is the south. You see the corporate sector here is blue. In the north, after 2000, it has always remained in the lending uh, territory, and the south has borrowed until the crisis. Now it has also started to stop borrowing. But what it really was is that the north shifted the money to the south, to the banks, to give you an example, I, I, I'm a professor in Italy, um, and I bought a car. I went to, I bought a, a Volkswagen, and um, they have their own bank, internal bank. I wanted to pay the loan back a little bit earlier. Um, I go to my bank where I got the credit. They say, okay, this we have give, This is the arrangement we had with um, Volkswagen Finance. I look at Volkswagen Finance. Where is it um, uh, domiciliated? Well, in Frankfurt, of course. Mm -hmm. right? And so it's Germany lending money so that in the South they can buy German products. Now, is that bad? No, it's not bad if we know what we are doing. If we have the tools and instruments to maintain all this correctly. Because it, it also has helped German <coughs> exporters and so on. Now, all in all, if you look at, especially in, in the recent time now in the crisis, you see that, um, or before the crisis, you see German, Dutch, Finnish, and Greek corporations have been net lenders since the early 2000s. But there's a difference. Germany and the Netherlands have been lending abroad while Greece and Finland has been lending to households. So the households were borrowing more than they were actually saving. So um, <clears throat> since the financial crisis, all corporations have started to deleverage and, and pay back. So no wonder there is no more investment, no more growth, no more job creation and all that. Here you see it for some member states. The um, households are the blue lines, and the corporate sector is the red one. You see Germany always lending the corporate sector. In France, mostly the corporate sector has been borrowing how it should be. In Italy, since the crisis, they are also moving into lending. Um, Greece, interesting case. Greece has always had a corporate sector that was lending, and the households were actually borrowing. <laughs> so it's the world upside down. 
Um, now, Ireland, we, okay, Ireland, this, this is not nice to be seen because the peak here is up to 20% of uh, the um, corporate deleveraging, which is the debt restructuring that happened with the banking system here, of course. Um, but, but you see also that um, <coughs> the households before the crisis were actually borrowing and not lending. And so what we find is, before the crisis, we had really consumer booms in Finland, in the Netherlands, in Spain, Ireland, and Greece. And we had investment booms to some degree in Spain, Portugal, Italy, and to a lesser degree in France. But in Germany, we had the rotating slump. Since the crisis, generalized deleveraging and public debt consolidation, so no wonder that there is no economic growth return. Now, we could say from a Keynesian point of view, fiscal policy should become a stimulus. Has it been a stimulus? Well, if households and corporations are savings, the government must be borrowing, otherwise you're just getting into a very vicious spiral down. <coughs> In the early crisis, I just showed you this is what happened. Since 2011, um, corporations and governments are reducing debt, we get recessions, and we get current account surpluses returning, which is the commission who says, hooray, you see, our policy recommendations are working. Yeah, yeah they're working with total um, collapse of the European economy. Now. Is there any evidence for Keynesian policy? Statistically speaking, it's very interesting. We find that um, you could test that with the so-called Granger causality in terms of these borrowings between the government and the corporate sector. And what we find is that it works. Uh, Keynesian <coughs> effects can be found for the euro area as a whole, but not really for the member states. Oh, this is a collapse here. You don't see the statistics, but um, what, what the, the so-called Granger causality tests show is that um, they test whether, uh, in terms of lending and borrowing, which comes first. So you could say the Keynesian effects are if the government follows, uh, the government starts to borrow, when the corporate sector stops to borrow, or alternatively, if the first the government borrows and then the corporate sector stops, then you would say it's crowding out and fiscal policy is negative. So you could actually test that. And this Granger causality, I don't know why it has disappeared here, but what we find is that it's significant on the euro level as a whole for a number of countries, including Ireland and Germany, um, what the data here that you can't see show is that it goes both ways. So it's not really significant for these uh, individual countries. There are few small countries, France being one, where you have evidence of Keynesian effects. But what is the conclusion from that? I think the conclusion from that is that you want to have fiscal policy on the aggregate of the euro area so that you can actually compensate these um, um, aggregate demand effects that are slowing down economic growth. But we also need to look at the regional redistribution. What we see and have seen now for the last uh, two decades is that on aggregate, the euro area works quite well. The, the regional redistributions are, of course, a different issue, and that is an issue of competitiveness. Now, one thing that uh, often I said, rotating booms, that is really about attracting investment opportunities. Some of that is about risk and the return on capital, but the risk factor is extremely important in this, and the other is competitiveness in that sense. Now, Typically, you have often probably heard or seen this kind of chart, which starts in the year 2000. The Commission calculates its indices for unit labor cost, and you say, ah, these terrible countries, Italy or, or 
Where's Ireland? Ireland is this one here. You see, I, we had this discussion earlier. Unit labor costs for Ireland are far higher than they were on the average of the euro area, and even much higher than what the ECB target of 2% should have been. Now, of course, Ireland has brought them down dramatically. And Germany has been down here um, pulling it all down. So no wonder Germany competitive, the gap between Italy and Germany, 22%. This can't go on, it's terrible, something needs to be done on this. Fair enough. The question is, who tells you that the year 2000, everyone should have been at the same point? There is a base year problem. What is the equilibrium level? A few years ago, I was at a seminar at ECB. Some of the top European economists discussed nearly nearly for a full day, how to deal with that. Nobody knew an answer. And then in my bathtub, I had an idea afterwards. And I calculate uh, a competitiveness index for unit labor costs that takes the equilibrium level and derives it from the assumption, which I think is reasonable in a single market with a single currency, that the return on capital should be the same as the average in the euro area. So in other words, if your return on capital in Ireland is higher than the average, it means you must be more competitive, you must be able to attract more investment into Ireland. If it is less, then of course you should not get much investment. Whether domestic or foreign doesn't matter, but it's just a measure for that. So. Um, from that, we can then calculate backward what should be the unit labor costs. And to make a long story short, here's the index. And what you see is this level, this horizontal line here, gives you the equilibrium level. Take Germany. In the 1990s, Germany was about 12 to 10 percent overvalued above the unit labor cost, above the equilibrium level, which means, of course, the return on capital in Germany in those years was less than the average of the UI. Then they did all kinds of um, measures in order to bring it down, and now Germany is undervalued, to, uh, not enormously, but nearly 8%. France, you see the opposite. In France, it used to be undervalued, then the, the, the critical year is 2002, it starts to deteriorate. Why 2002? It's the year of the re-election of Chirac. It is when Chirac in the second round has to face up to Le Pen. And I think that this has led to a political dynamic whereby the right-wing parties who have governed France since then, pretty much, have, resist, ha have not had the courage to resist wage increases because they were afraid that they lose voters to the, to the, to the Front National. So uh, you, you have a fairly disastrous development there in France. Italy had been undervalued partly because of the ERM crisis in the early 90s, but now they're a little bit above there. Ireland has always, since the mid-1990s, I mean, really, if you go back in the chart, you see it starts with the ERM crisis. Ireland has been undervalued significantly, which means it has this great competitive advantage in aggregate. And that's probably also why Ireland is pulling out more easily from the crisis by Portugal, also undervalued, but less than Ireland. Greece, however, always been overvalued. So here's, a, here's one chart for all member states of the euro area, and it's quite interesting because you see Greece is now, in 2013, overvalued by 13%, then comes France, overvalued by 8 Austria also close to 8 Italy, 2.5%, Spain, also 1%, 2%. Everyone else is undervalued. Germany, um, now 6%. But the really big business is in the new member states in Eastern Europe. Uh, Slovakia topping it with 55% uh, 
unit labor costs below the average of the equilibrium of the euro area. And of course, that leads to enormous shift of restructuring in terms of uh, competitive advantages, investment in the euro area, and so on. And um, Ireland is at minus 22. So, I mean, really doing very well, but of course, <laughs> there are others um, like Slovakia, Latvia, uh, that are doing much better. Luxembourg is sort of not really relevant for this kind of exercise. So, the conclusion of all this, what do I say? I say we have to stop thinking of the euro area as a fixed exchange rate regime, which means we live in Euroland. It is our integrated um, economic space, and it works like any other e integrated economic space. But it means a unified single macroeconomy needs also an institution to manage this integrated single economy, and we need a single macroeconomic management institution for that. Having said that, I believe that the implication is that if you have that and you delegate more and you centralize more decision-making to the European Union, then you need also more democratic control of that. That's pretty obvious in itself, and that's why I think what is right now going on in terms of the power struggle between the European Parliament and the European Council about who's going to be the next president of the Commission is absolutely crucial. It is, it is the, the democratic moment of the European Union. It is, it is England in the 17th century. It, it is uh, court against country, council against parliament. However, competitiveness is important for regional divergences, and uh, one has to look at competitiveness issues and also to see maybe how to support some regions in becoming more competitive. But the bottom line is, economically speaking, also that a sustainable euro requires balanced growth, balanced growth, not the reduction of current account deficits. Thank you very much.